Okay, all rise to the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Clerk, please call the roll. Councilman Alvarez, absent. Councilwoman Eckhart. Here. Councilman Larka. Here. Councilman Lord. Here. Supervisor Hay. Here. Notation of the exits in the front and the rear in electronic device, please put it on vibrate. Um, we have mostly presentations this <coughs> evening, and the first one is with the United States Census Bureau and Karen Barnes. Oh, by the way, there's a rental charge for my computer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, you'll need, yes, you need the mic. Okay, good evening and thank you for having me and I sincerely apologize for throwing your meeting off. Um, so I, I think people here are pretty sophisticated by, about the census um, based on your response rates, but uh, 2020 is going to be conducted differently than any other census has in the past. So just quickly, um, if you could hit the slide there. Okay. So basically, we do the census because it's mandated by the Constitution. And it, it <coughs> excuse me, it determines several things. It determines your representation in Washington. It determines um, districting although in New York, school districting is a little bit different. And it also determines how 675 billion federal dollars are allocated toward the states um, and therefore the communities. So that's the reason it's very important. It's one of the reasons it's very important to get your census numbers where they need to be. Next slide, please. Um, one of the issues that has been at the forefront, um, especially this year, is data protection and the confidentiality of the census. The census is 100% confidential. Um, we, we gather information by tracks, so we cannot, you cannot literally go in and get an address to see where that information is coming from. We have something called PII, which is personally identifiable information. That information is immediately washed out when it gets to the Census Bureau, so no one has access to that. Um, the president or cabinet members or Congress can't call the census and say, I need to see this information because for whatever reason, they can't do it. Um, it has been challenged in court several times. Every time the court has upheld the confidentiality of the census. So it's very important that people understand that. Um, it's especially important for your immigrant population, but honestly, we have found that there are American citizens who do not fill out their census because they are afraid of what people will do with the information. And I'd like to tell people, frankly, Google has more information on you than probably the census does. Um, so uh, I won't get near that information, but when I took this job, I had to swear an oath um, that I would not reveal anything, any confidentiality, um, any confidential information. And um, if I do, I'm subject to a $250,000 fine and five years in prison, and that goes all the way up the chain. So next, next slide, please. Um, this, this year, the census is going to be conducted, as I said, very differently. In the past, everybody got the paper ballot, you filled it out, and you mailed it in. Um, this year, there will be four ways to respond to the census. The first three are what we call self-response. The first self-response uh, way, and this is what we're hoping 80% of the population will do, is by your computer or your smartphone. Uh, now, we recognize that not everybody has computers or access to the web, so we do have supporting um, uh, programs in place for that, and that's where your complete count comes in, your community to support, you know, and we'll talk about that. Um, the second way is by your regular phone, your landline, you can respond. And um, those, if you res respond via your landline or your computer, you have access to 59 different languages. Um, so it's everything in English is in Spanish, but there's there's quite a few languages there that um, we use to help people fill out this form. The third way is the old-fashioned way, which is you get your census form in the mail, and we ask you to fill it out and mail it back in. And then the fourth way is what we call uh, it's non-response, and that is your friendly census taker. 
comes to your house and says, we notice we have not gotten a response from you. Um, we, do you mind if we do it now? So if people don't want people, census coming to their house, the best thing they can do is fill out the census form. Um, and early March, so, so this is how it's going to go. Early March, you, we'll be sending out uh, mailers that says the census is coming. And then we'll send out a second one that says the census is here. Um, and you'll get a little um, ID on that, that you number that you put in your computer, and that will identify your, your building. Because the census goes by um, addresses, not by names. So that will identify your address, and you can fill it out. Um, you can also use that for, the, for your phone. And if you, if you speak another language, um, the card will tell you what number to call for the language that you want to speak, OK? Um, around April 1 is Census Day. So that's the day we're saying, please, everybody fill out your census form. And after that, we will send out reminders. Um, starting about the second week in March, we will be able to tell you who in your community is responding and who's not. That's, again, where it becomes, it becomes important for you to have a committee in place so that when you see that certain areas are not responding, you can get out there, you can get your boots to the ground and say, hey, guys, you really need to get this going. Um, and then uh, starting in May, we will be sending out um, enumerators, basically, to collect the data. So next slide, please. Um, OK, so I've covered this. You can go to the next one, please. That's not relevant. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention, in addition to filling out your census forms, is that we are recruiting people to work for the census. Most of these are enumerator jobs, but there are other jobs as well. They're tech jobs, clerical jobs. The jobs in Westchester pay between 18 and $22 an hour. Um, we like to hire people in the community they live in to work. In other words, we like to hire people who are going, if we're going to have enumerators in, in Southeast, we hope that they live in Southeast as well. Um, so to the extent that you feel that there are people here who might be interested in these jobs, again, we, we urge you to work with us to, to recruit those. So a lot, of the, uh, facility, a lot of the towns that we're working with are holding job fairs and making an announcements about the census and the jobs that are available. And if you'd like, I can get into more detail about that um, later on. OK, next slide, thank you. So what are the obstacles to the census? Basically, we know that it's, our population has changed a lot. Um, the, the, a lot of the issues that we face are um, un, unreported uh, immigrants. Um, one of the biggest undercounted groups in the census, believe it or not, are children under five. Um, across all segments of the population. We don't really have a good answer, reason for that. I mean, we think that people think, well, you know, my child is a toddler, she's two, why should I put her on the census? And the reason is because by the time the next census comes around, she'll be 12 and she'll be going through a school system that didn't get the funds it was, it probably could have gotten had she been counted. So um, another area are seniors. Uh, that is also another area of un undocumented, uh, un undercounted. And that's, again, where your uh, local uh, community can, uh, complete count community, come in and, and support that. Um, so one of the things that we're doing is we're partnering with libraries. Libraries have uh, computer labs. They're a great place for uh, people who are not computer savvy to go and get help filling out their census form if they want to do that. Um, but um, basically, Talking, you know, as I mentioned, the committee, we're, we're hoping every area will get a complete count committee. Um, you know Westchester County has one, uh, Yonkers has one, Peekskill, Port Chester, all of these areas. And basically that is to get together the trusted voices. It's not necessarily the city government, although it would be good to have a liaison on the city government. But a lot of times it's not for profits, businesses, and other people who work in the community who are trusted voices who can get the word out there that it's important for Southeast that you fill out your census form. Um, so next slide. 
Um, we have different ways that we support you. We have, um, you know, if you put together a complete count committee, or even if you don't, we have uh, informational flyers, we have digital information, we have PSAs, we have a number of things. All you have to do is have someone contact me and I would be very happy to supply that information. And I think that's basically it. Still got three minutes. <laughs> well, time's for credit questions. Anybody have any questions? And what do you expect for town governments to do for you? You're going to send us something? S say again for me. What do you expect the town governments to do? You're going to ask us to do something, post things on our web page? What are you going to be asking? Well, it's really, okay, so first of all, it's for you. It's, it's not for us. It's for you, for your community to get their count up. So it's really up to you what you want to do, if anything. Um, what we do is support you in, by telling you what other, you know, what things have worked in the past, what other communities are doing. Um, if you're comfortable with where your numbers are, you don't have to do anything. But I would suggest to you that every person counts in terms of dollars. Um, and your population, you know it better than I do, may have changed since the last census. I mean, you have, you have a relatively good response rate, um, but there are communities that are higher. So. Okay. And uh, will we know, going through the process, will you know and be able to tell us that, gee, you're really way behind the, the spot you were, or how will we know, I guess, is the question. So you mean in terms of response? Yes. Okay. So um, yes, I will be able to tell you that. But if you don't put a committee together to get that word out, it won't do you any good to know that, because you won't have a, an infrastructure in place to go out and make it happen, because it's going to happen too fast. So everybody now is doing their complete count committees. It's not that, it sounds very fancy, it's really not. Um, you guys do committees all the time. What I would advise is that you have somebody who represents the government, and then you get some of your chosen, as I said, trusted voices. And that varies from community to community. It's very often faith-based groups, uh, businesses, uh, not-for-profits, people who have a voice in the community who will be heard to say, really, guys, we really need every dollar we can get uh, for Southeast because this is going to affect schools, hospitals, roads. Um, you know, we, I, I, they did a training today on schools and how much the, uh, m how much federal money goes into schools. That's after-school programs, lunches, uh, as, as well as, you know, the, the basic school infrastructure. So, and there are communities that take really, really advantage of every, every bit of the money they can get. So, you know, our job, as I started this six months ago, I went to what we call the low count areas. And those are, you know, understandably places like Yonkers or Mount Vernon. I didn't have to go to Bronxville. They called. <laughs> you know, um, and you can imagine what their response rate is. So. Okay. Um, is there a date when the census, when they stop counting? Yes. Um, it will be, uh, as I recall, the end of July. That's end it. of July 2020. Yes. Okay. And are you able to tell us what our response rate is? Or was? Well, y yes. We will be able to do that. So, um, as I said to you, um, as the numbers, it's something called a live count. Mm -hmm. So as people are responding on a weekly basis, we are gathering those numbers, and we would be able to tell you, okay, here's what you're doing so far, and here's where you're doing it, and here's where you're not doing it. Okay. And then once it's all done, yes, we can definitely. Um, and can you tell us our response rate from 2010? Well, you can, yes, uh, yes. That's, you ha that's available to you on the census site. Okay. Um, let me mention something called Rome. It's, um, it's, it's our area um, outreach mapper. And uh, if you go on the census site and you will put in, it, it, unfortunately it does it by county, uh, I, I can't do it by zip code. And then you'll find Southeast there and you hone in on that. It will show you not only what your response rate is, but what it is for every tract. And it will give you some very valuable information. So not only what, what the response rate is, but the, the median age, the median income, the median right. education, all of that is right there. And if I will, if you have any problem with that and you need help with that, I'd be happy, more than happy to help you. I'll, I will give you my card. Okay. I have used the site. I thought it was really good. I just didn't know we could get the response rate, so that will be very there helpful. There is. And right. let me just be very clear about that. When you go into Rome and it predict, it's, it's really a predictor 
of what we expect you to have this year. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of what happened in 2010, but it's also a combination of the response we've been getting from our other surveys, like the American uh, Community Survey, um, which happens every year. Right. And that's a pretty, yeah, right. so. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone from the public? Everybody gonna fill out their census? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Should have brought the forms with you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't okay. have those yet. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank very you. much. Again, I apologize. You can have this here and then you can email us what you have. Oh, don't give it back. That's fine. <laughs> do you want it? Yeah. Um, do you want any? Uh, I ordered materials for you. They were not, um, they didn't get to me in time. Do, okay. Would you like me to send materials for the council? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And we'll put it up on the internet. Like it, so. Yeah, I'll give it to you when we get this started. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the second item on the agenda this evening is the Putnam County Board of Elections early voting. Do you need to scream, by the way? Do you, do you need that? Okay. No. We're going to have it short and sweet. Mm -hmm. How many seconds? Three. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, that last presentation was pretty short. So. Yes, well, it's good. So my name is Kathy Croft, and I'm one of the commissioners at the Putnam County Board of Elections, and this <clears throat> is my co-commissioner, Anthony Scanapieco. And this year, the legislature um, passed early voting laws. So New York State became the 38th state to have early voting, which begins uh, 10 days before the general election. It begins on October 26th and runs through November 3rd. And um, our one early voting <coughs> location will be held at the Putnam County Board of Elections which is located at 25 Old Route 6 in Carmel. It's right next to the bowling alley near the Humane Society. We'll be open um, Saturday. We're open the 26th from 9 until 2. We open at 9 o'clock every morning for early voting, so we kept that consistent. So it's 9 to 2 on the weekends, and Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, it's 9 to 5, and Thursday, Tuesday and Thursday, it's 9 until 8 o'clock at night. Um, the, lo the door to the early voting, we're going to have it in our training room, so that's in the back of the building. There'll be plenty of signage and there's plenty of parking, and we encourage um, people to show up. We're also going to be introducing our e-poll books, and we will be, um, we're getting rid of the paper poll books, and we'll be, um, everybody will be signing in electronically. So I figured I'd just do one person this evening just to show you how it works. Um, I'm gonna look up Wonder Woman. So we, all you have to do is put the last three letters in and then the first three letters and you do a search. It comes up with her name. I was practicing this afternoon so she's already voted so I can't process her. That's a terrible example by the way. <laughs> Did you want me to do Peter Parker? Because I can do somebody else. <laughs> um, but at any rate, and also for early voting, we're going to be printing ballots on demand. So this is all new technology. Um, we'll be using the e-poll books also on election day at all our poll sites. No longer will you have to go to your specific election district table. You just walk in and go up to the sign-in table. You're going to be you're going to sign in. You're going to be given a ballot receipt. You're going to walk over to the ballot table. You're going to hand them that receipt. You're going to be given your ballot go vote it at the privacy booths and have it scanned into the voting machine. And then we also have a help desk in case there is any problems. So um, I left you all schedules. I have schedules out. There's schedules out in the hallway for early voting. And would you like to say something? You did a great job. Oh, <laughs> how about that? <laughs> so, but um, does anybody have any questions? Well, I was hoping to grill Tony, but now I don't have oh, any no. questions. No, I don't. I, no. <laughs> yes, it costs. It costs. It's going to cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay. So this was the money, and it's your money because it's grants from New York State. But right. we did receive, will, or will be receiving around one hundred seventeen thousand dollars to pay for the e-poll books and for the um, print-on-demand ballots. So, all right, no questions. 
are are all the counties using yes. ePoll books? And no, no. No, this is and you are a, one of the start or the first people using it or first No, there's a I don't know the exact yeah, number. Yeah, I suspect a couple of the small counties. It's just, they're just too small right now to get started to do it, but they'll be doing it soon, sooner or later. Yeah, <coughs> but we still have to have a paper backup just in case the power goes out on election day. So there will be a condensed version of the old paper poll books that we can use. So, all thank right, you. thank you, okay. thank you both for coming. Okay. Any questions from the public? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, next on the agenda is the Putnam County Legislative Chairman Joe Costolano and Paul uh, Yonke, Putnam County Legislator. Update on the Danbury, Connecticut, and Town of Southeast sewer line. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. I know that Supervisor Hay, I've, I've promised you all along when there was something to report, I'd come and report to you. There's not a lot to report, but uh, now's a good time to fill you in on where we are. Did you give your uh, name? I'm sorry? Did you say your name? I don't recall if you did. You Paul Yonke. I know you. Okay. <laughs> um, and this is Chairman Castellano. Good. Thank you. Uh, in early 2017, the county executive um, in Putnam County, uh, County Executive Bodell recognized that there was a need both in, for environmental reasons and for economic reasons that the underutilized corridor on Route 6 um, would be best served with a, with a sewer system. Um, because of regulations, we can't build our own. So she, in, she kicked off in September 2017 with a meeting of representatives of her administration and the city of Danbury. Uh, the basic idea is that if there are more users for Danbury, it would help the ratepayers of the Danbury sewer system while providing both environmental protection and economic op opportunity for properties along that Route 6 corridor. Um, the, the legislature funded both a feasibility study through J.R. Fulchetti Engineering and has funded legal work through Hogan and Rossi to begin the project. Um, the initial study identified properties that would be included in the district. Uh, there was a general uh, estimate of the gallons per day flow that would be required to be purchased from the city of Danbury. Um, based on that initial feasibility study, RFPs were issued for, engine, for engineering firms uh, to do design work with estimates on cost of construction. Um, RF, the RFP was issued, H2M, which is a company, they're down, they're down on Long Island and they have offices in Westchester, was selected. Uh, the contract has been negotiated, but it has not yet been executed. Um, That's where we're at now. We don't have any estimates of cost of construction right now. Um, the original feasibility study basically has a map of the properties that border Route 6 from the Danbury line to the village of Brewster. It's mostly, mostly commercial properties. Um, you should know environmentally, over 70% of the improved properties along that corridor have septics that have either failed or have outlived their useful lives. Um, so we're moving forward, uh, but we're still, as uh, somebody said yesterday, we're, we're in the bottom of the first inning at this point. I forwarded you a letter from the concerned residents of Southeast and they asked a couple questions. Are you, do you have that with you by the chance tonight? I do, I do. You, it, it's too preliminary any... to talk about, uh, we don't have an estimated cost of the overall project. I've heard numbers between 10 million and 40 million. Okay, but until the engineering firm gets involved with the design, uh, we don't know if we're going along the, the, um, the, rail, the railroad bed. We don't know if we're going to go in the DOT right-of-way. Uh, that has not yet been <coughs> determined. How many properties did you find between? There are about 100 properties. 100? Ser served by the district, yeah. Proposed for the district. 
Um, we don't know what the monthly capital cost is. We don't, uh, I, I didn't explore the Danbury sewer rates because they're subject to change anyway. Um, once I do, I can tell you this, once a district is established, there'll be a public hearing. The, the, establishment, the establishment of the district is uh, subject to a, to a referendum. All right, so if, 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 if the folks in the district don't want it, they can put it up for a vote. And how do they do that, if and when it comes? 51% of the, the uh, assessed value of the district would have to sign a petition uh, to, to have the permissive referendum. Um, but keep in mind, if, if this is not economically feasible, the New York State Control, Comptroller's Office is not going to permit this project to move forward. So we're still in the early stages. The, this H2M, the engineering firm, they're going to be hired, and, and we're using grant money. We have uh, 750000 of grant money that's through the DEC. The, the grant that we received for the engineering study is seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So all these questions will be answered by by H two M. Now I'm not sure if you're aware, but way back when I've been on the legislature, way back when when the watershed regulations first came in, and Bob Bondi had made a similar proposal to ship actually all the waste from Putnam County outside of Putnam County, and this quarter was you know recommended at the time, and of course that never came to fruition. So we have some people out there now that are, I can see one, he calls me probably once a month wanting to know when, <laughs> and I tell him it's a long ways away. So is there? I, I believe when the dominoes start to fall, if, if it's economically feasible for those dominoes to fall, I think once, once the design work is done and, and the project begins to move forward, I think at that point it might move quickly. Now, the county is currently not in any sewer, they have any sewer water districts currently? The county itself? No. Is no. first? No, the only reason is the county's involved in this is because, number one, we're, we're crossing municipal boundaries with the village of Brewster. The village of Brewster is involved in this. And we're also crossing the state line. And as far as anybody knows, uh, we don't know of any, we just don't know of any other uh, interstate sewer contracts. But there's no intent on the county's part to get form this and then put it in our laps and say, here, you take care of it now? Take care of it in what way? Well, as you know, we inherited, the town of Southeast inherited about uh, three sewer districts and eight or nine water districts that we don't want. From the county? No, not from the no. county. I'm trying to find out. Well, from public, private, on? private, yeah. Yeah, they walked uh, away from it. And is the county going to maintain this system if it stays and comes into up and running? As, as I understand it, this is the county's baby and, and it would be the county's responsibility. And I want to at least make it clear now so everyone knows that we were not in the loop in the beginning. You've been trying to keep us in the loop, but we now tonight we know about as much as we knew two years ago. Supervisor, we, we, we speak frequently and I, te I tell you that things are moving along slowly. These meetings <clears> take place. You know, every two or three months, uh, Councilman Larka has attended a couple of our meetings. Uh, Chairman LaPerch from the Planning Board attends our meetings. Uh, the, the frequency of these meetings is not very, it's not very often. Okay. I just, you know, uh, we, get, we get calls on it. There's people out there that come to ask, you know, five or six times, I don't want to be a naysayer, I'm just going to tell them it's going to be a long time. Don't, don't bang on it yet. I, you know how government, the time moves very slowly in government. I'm well aware. That's why I want people so, to know it's not going to be tomorrow. It's not going to be tomorrow, no. And this is, um, as Paul mentioned, this is a first of, a, of, a, of its kind. We don't even know of another interstate sewer district. So this is going to be a benefit to both. Danbury has excess uh, sewer capacity, and they're looking for, obviously, sewage. And it could work for our benefit as well. Um, you know, with their sewer district is a bit older and certainly they've done some work to it, but they're looking for more customers. They don't have the customers there. And with all the technology advances, you know, people use less water now than they ever have in the past, so they don't have, they have capacity to use, and as I've spoken in the past, 
you know, 30 years ago, the first time I ever drove down this road, where you have two lanes of road going both directions, it, it is prime location, and you have the reservoirs right there. Um, <coughs> DEP definitely is approving of this plan. As we spoke about, 70% of these properties have either failing septics or old, outdated septics that uh, need to be fixed, and this is a great opportunity for all of us. I know we're w way in the early stages of this, but I think it's going to be a good thing for Putnam County and for the town of Southeast, of course. Well, if there's any way they could expand the study and include Route 22, there's probably as many properties, if not more, and it's more prime real yeah. estate, believe it or not, on 22 than Route 6. Much. There's definitely a possibility going forward with, you know, it, we're, again, super early stages, but it, it, it potentially could happen, but right now we're looking at this one corridor. It's been discussed. It's been discussed, but for now, we think that it's it's m most important if to get this ball rolling down the Route 6 corridor, get it to the village of Brewster. Properties like the Bull and Barrel would be involved in this. Um, I know they've had septic issues. Um, before we start putting a spur up 22, and but it has been discussed. It has been discussed. Okay. And there is there is enough capacity. Danbury Danbury's over designed their plant. And with all the, the water saving measures in, you know, plumbing fixtures, um, they're, not, they're not utilizing the plant up to the, the, the potential that they, they expected. Um, and that's why there's a, a, an excess capacity right now. Now, in the audience, I know quite a few business owners are here. If you'd like to ask a question, would you like to come up and ask that question now? Tony, can the board ask first or no? No, okay, go. Public will be next. Okay. Um, only because I have a lot for you. Oh. <laughs> um, I, fo I wanted to be more prepared, and my apologies to everyone, I'm not as prepared as I'd like. I foiled for this information back on August 5th, and it, there's a great deal of information, and unfortunately I haven't gotten much back. So could you tell us a bit about the Falsetti report? That was the, was that about 35, 37,000 with the Jay Hogan um, Thirty-five or thirty-seven? What? Thousand dollars. I think it was thirty-one five. Okay. Thirty-two five. Okay. Uh, pardon. Okay. I, I don't. I don't have it in front of me, so. I'm no, no, no. I'm going from memory. Okay. Can you tell us anything about that report? What I would haven't. Would you like to know about it? Well, what what it established? Did it just establish the number of properties? Did it? I mean, I don't. The, the, I haven't key, seen it, so the, I don't. The, know. the full Shetty report, and and I'll make sure you get a copy of it. Okay, I'll, have to, I'll be happy to sit down with you and go over it. The the main piece of the full Shetty report is a fold-out map, okay. which I'll spare you the suspense, um, is basically a map of Route 6 from Danbury to the, to the village line right. with a red line drawn along the, 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 I think I've the northern those. and the south, southern border yeah. behind the prop, all the properties that border Route 6. If the property doesn't border Route 6, it's not in the district. Okay. Um, that, that's that's the key piece, the key element of the full Shetty report. Okay. Um, when you supply that to the town, can we put that on our website for people to see as well? I'll make sure you get it. Oh, but can you go on our website as well? Okay, thank you. I, I did get some, I will say that, maps, but they, they were in color, which is okay. I just, it's they, what I Yeah, perceive, they are in so. color. Not what I got, but that's fine. Oh, oh. Um, and I want to thank you both for coming, if by the way. I'm sorry. Any, Lynn, anytime you want, I'll meet with you. You can make copies of everything that I have. Great. Because so far, I, I I don't know whether I can attend those meetings. Are they open to the public or not? I don't know. Okay. I don't call the meetings as a county executive. Okay, because I would love to attend those. Okay, then I won't have so many questions. Um, so I'll make sure you're invited. Thank you. <laughs> um, it won't be a quorum, so unless Tony decides he wants to go. But um, my other question is, I know it's very preliminary, but we had problems with one of our water districts because what we couldn't negotiate with the village was that our rates would be tied to the village, their rates of the water district would be tied to the village rates. Um, will, do you, has, any, has there been any discussion on tying these rates, our sewer rates to the to city, of, city of Danbury contracts with five other municipalities. Don't right. ask me to name them, but I know uh, Newtown Bethel. is one, Bethel, Bethel Ridgefield. Um, they, they contract with five other municipalities. Those municipalities pay the same rate as the rate payers in the city of Danbury, and we okay. have been assured that we will pay the same rate as those okay. those other municipalities and the city of Danbury. So that was actually one of our first questions when we first started discussing right. this. Obviously, we need to make sure that 
the rates are the same. Yeah, otherwise there's just no point in even, right. yeah. I, I think you received a $1.2 million grant um, in December of 17, a CFA grant. That'll be used, that'll be used for the construction of the that'll project. That'll be the actual construction. Yeah, okay. that's so not this, for design, that's not for okay. feasibility. Okay, um, all right, um, let's see. So there's no estimate at all yet per cost for the project. As I said, I've heard 10 million and I've heard 40 million, okay. and every number in between. Okay, and um, you probably know that the cost the cost estimates for Danbury for their they needed to redo their sewage system, and it yep. was about 102 million dollars. Do we know? Um, have those upgrades been completed? And if so, do you know what the final cost was? Because that will clearly. I don't know if they've been completed. I don't okay. know. They were started, or they were supposed to start a couple of years ago, and they said it would take two years, but we all know how long that takes. So, um, okay. And while I've got you, and um, I just heard that um, Danbury is also considering a, um, a rail route down Route 6 as well, and that I read that um, the county would be paying $200,000 towards, do you know anything about this? I read the same thing you read. Okay. I do know that they're exploring um, a train line from Danbury. the center of Danbury to the southeast station, uh, which would alleviate a lot of the traffic that comes over and would free up some parking. Um, I have asked our representative, I don't know if you were at the meeting that night, Neil Zuckerman, yeah. our representative with the MTA. I've asked him if there's a way in the future, because New York residents are paying MTA payroll taxes, um, right. if, if there's a way in the future to number one, give benefit to priority to Southeast residents, then New York State residents, and then the Connecticut residents as far as fares and parking. Um, and he, he, he took it, he took the, the question quite seriously and he was gonna bring it back to the MTA board. Um, so that's really all I know about it. I right. know that there's been a preliminary discussion. Uh, the county executive went to um, NIMTIC. Right. Please don't ask me what, what, what that stands for, but she yes. went to NIMTIC and she Transportation. Got commitment. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if it was for 750 or a million dollars okay. uh, to explore a study to, on the to, rail. To, to, to run a rail line. Okay. I mean, my concern is, I, I'm not saying it's a bad idea, I won't know until we look at it, but it's like really frustrating to me if the county's gonna pay 200,000, I know you'd have to vote on it, when we do pay a lot in the MTA tax I, as it is, so. The article was the first I had heard of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions uh, for us to pay 200,000 to explore uh, you know, a benefit, something that would benefit Dan Danbury, but I, I want to be very, very clear that that project and the sewer project are have totally nothing separate. to do with each other. I was just since we were down just, that yeah. road, so, um, okay, so we don't, there's just not a lot that we know right now. Would you be able to find out for us um, about the Danbury sewer system, or do you want, is that something I should do to see if they've spent, if they've uh, renovated the plant and how much it cost? Because th those costs are going to be passed along to us as well as if, if we get into the system. You, you threw out a very large number. Uh, they also have very large, a large number right. of rate payers. Right. Um, I, I, I would think that the state of Connecticut would have the same kind of oversight that the state of New York has in that if it was, if, if it was economically not feasible, they wouldn't allow them to, right. to, to you know. Right. That was there, actually. There would be, be a bond. Right. You know, that certainly must be affordable. The, the business owners I talk to over in Connecticut don't seem to have a problem with. Right. Uh, and that was a referendum rates. that the public did vote on, so the public approved it, yeah. that expenditure. I was just wondering where it stood since it'll affect I'll our find rates out. over here. I'll find out. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. John, Anyone? Oh, oh, um, oh, yeah. The Falsetto report was $32,500. Was that also the legal? Was that part of the, did the no, legal thing? Uh, legal no, was separate. I have those numbers too. Uh, legal was $19,235.79. There was also a permit for $250 uh, for a total of uh, $51,985.79 in, in, in those areas of the engineering, legal, and the permit. You identified what the uh, engineering did. What did the legal do? What legal guys do? <laughs> they're exploring the, they're, the, the the legality of of uh, signing a contract with with a, a, a city in another state. 
Okay. Um, there, there was a lot of a lot of background uh, research uh, that needed to be done prior you know, during these discussions. Is the Putnam County Law Department involved with this as well? Putnam County. <laughs> They were support, but but Hogan and Rossi did most of the work. Okay. And again, go, we go back to the point that we don't we couldn't find another interstate sewer line before, so we did need our attorneys to look at this and make sure we're doing everything the correct way. Okay. Um, did John? Can I just ask one? Did it really that the gist of it was getting the? I mean, the gist of this report, and I haven't seen it. Is really just that there were roughly 100 properties. There wasn't any more than that, and then the there's also an estimate of uh, uh, flows per day. Okay. You, you, he estimated on a vacant piece of land what the potential development on that property okay. would be, and okay. then he extrapolated from that a potential for. I mean, it, okay. there was a lot of estimating, a lot of okay. um, guesstimates. Right. Otherwise, I would say Lori Bell could have done this, but okay. Pick the word. Go ahead, John. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just have one question. Uh, the, the thought of a train line from Danbury to Southeast is, I think, really intriguing. And you also mentioned that the sewer line may get put on the rail bed. So when you do those feasibilities, can it maybe some of that construction cost could be split if, these, if both of these projects were feasible? But um, I just think it's really interesting. It was an interesting point that was brought up by the engineers at a certain time that if you ran the sewer line through the rail bed, it, the, the, the excavation cost would be uh, less. You'd certainly know that you're not going through rock, which you may hit in the, uh, the right-of-way of Route 6. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it was just an interesting avenue to explore, and I think when, when H2M gets involved, uh, they'll, they'll do the analysis and determine which is our better way to go. Is this, is this railway the same as the bike path is going to be going to the Connecticut? Yes. Potentially. That, that would be great if we could do both. And, and again, everybody knows that rail line that goes from the village of Brewster basically over to the Danbury Mall. Uh, the last time a train went over the bridge uh, by where um, the Honda dealership is now uh, was 2007 and the, the bridge has been closed down. Uh, so, you know, it's interesting, I mean, again, we're really preliminary study looking at this, but it'd be great if there was a light rail <coughs> system that was coming from Danbury to the village and somehow going in um, to where Kobachers is in that area, because that's where that rail line goes to. Um, if it was light rail, it'd be nice because people would get off in Brewster and, and walk around and I think revitalize that area. Or potentially they could have their own sort of train line that would go from Danbury and you'd sit in the train until you get to New York City. So again, very early stages, but there's potential there. I, I'd love the idea of a light rail line where some, you know somebody can go on in Danbury, head to Brewster, and then head right back to Danbury. It would be a bonus for the village and for the town, I think. But again, we're so early in the discussion. And then at the same time, we could tie in the sewer line, a potential bike path over there, but the line is there. The bridge needs to be replaced by um, the Honda dealership. And, uh, and if we could fit everything in at the same time, it would be fantastic. But again, two different projects, and we're really early on the train line. Um, Thank you. Any more? Yeah, I, I had some questions. Good. Okay. Um, so there are 100 properties that have been identified. Is it 120? 100. 100, 100. 100 okay. even? 100. Yeah, 100. Approximately. Right. Yeah. Okay. You want to ask more? Or? No. Okay, um, and 70% of the um, properties along there, or 70% of the voting people, or the voting properties for the referendum have septic sewage, or sewage uh, septants no. that failed? No? That's not what it, no. Oh, no, I'm just trying to understand. I'm Over 70% of the properties that are improved along that, that, that are identified in that study, over 70% of the improved properties have septics that have either failed or have outlived their useful life. And how many of the 100 properties are they? Um, I'll, I'll have to I'll look at the study. Uh, I, it's in the study. It's okay. significant. It's, uh, drive down there and, and look at how many properties are No, I, I don't know. I don't have the study. Yeah. I, don't I don't know what the number is. Um, and when a referendum takes place, it will be um, weighted as to uh, the assessed values of the properties, or will it be? 100 votes and 100 uh, and 51. We haven't we haven't gotten that far, but I don't okay. think that's how the permissive referendum works. It's 51 percent 
of the assessed value of the okay. property owners have yeah. to, to create the referendum. Okay. And, and then those properties, those property owners effective, affected, I, I, I don't know if they get one vote each. Uh, that ha We haven't gone down that road yet. Okay, and if someone wanted to be out of it, they, and did the referendum uh, passed that, that we were gonna have a, a sewage or a septic system, they would not be able to opt out of it. They would have to participate in any of the calls. Well, I understand that you can't opt out. If you're identified in the district, you're in the district. Okay. Thanks. There will be, there will be, as, as, at least at this point, we've discussed having capital, cost of expense, and operation and maintenance expenses uh, at two different lines on, you know, as far as uh, tax bills. Okay. Thank you. I have one last question, sorry, but who did um, the study, uh, who came up with the numbers on the septic, fa septic failures or outliving their useful life? How was that determined? Uh, Putnam County Health Department. Okay. And so that would be just, uh, I don't know, on the, well, obviously the failures, but on outliving its useful life, that's just people who haven't renewed or dug, dug a new septic or? No, the, the, the pro they were designed prior to the current standards. And, okay. they, and, and if, if, if that property was built or, or improved today, uh, it wouldn't meet the current standard. I believe the year is uh, 1973. If you had built your septic prior to 73, the county wouldn't know about it. Right. So, and certainly if you had a septic from, from that, back, that far back, you probably need to improve it. And of course, if you improve it, you're supposed to go to the Department of Health and get the proper permits to do so. Uh, okay. but I'm sure it's a rough estimate of the 70%. And I'm sure many of these people are probably waiting to see what happens next with the sewer line before they put a $15,000, $20,000 uh, cost on replacing right. their septic. Right. That could potentially not right. be necessary in the near future, hopefully. Right. And, and my concern would be, like, we've approved, um, uh, we've approved development out there with septic, you know, 185,000 square feet for a shopping center. I'm hoping that we all did the right thing by approving these and that if this doesn't go in, that they'll be fine. So just, it's troublesome, so thanks. Okay, is the board <coughs> questions? You can come back, but public. Would you mind coming up to the mic, please? And other people I know, please come up and answer your questions. Don't call me, I don't know. Um, uh, Rick O'Rourke, as a 40-year resident of the town of Southeast, um, Back in 1996, the city of New York originally proposed to sewer the village of Brewster on Main Street, and that was it. There was no proposal for any other larger area. It was brought to the attention of the city of New York um, by me that we had failing septics on Marvin Avenue and that I had environmental conservation uh, uh, violations that had occurred uh, and that if you were going to be sewering and protecting uh, the watershed, it made sense for uh, the city of New York to encourage uh, sewerage uh, services in areas where there were failing septics. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, county, state, and uh, the village of Brewster representatives got together as a coalition and uh, an application and advocacy occurred to have the city of New York consider sewering the entire village, but in particular, Marvin Avenue. Uh, so the, uh, the expense of this was picked up essentially by the city of New York. And it did so uh, through a funding mechanism with the Environmental Facilities Corporation that essentially administered uh, a lot of the payments. Bottom line was that because of the, uh, the activities and urgency and advocacy of that coalition, instead of just sewering what was then, back then, this, the extent of the sewer service, and Tony, you probably remember this because it was just a Main Street trunk line, and then there was a, a connector up to the Garden Street School, and that was it. Uh, but as a result of, of, of advocacy, the, uh, the city of New York uh, then took it upon itself to sewer the entire village. I mention this because, quite frankly, when you're involved in something of this magnitude and you're talking about so many properties that have failing septics, uh, the city of New York, because of the watershed regulations and the uh, surface water treatment rules uh, that are in place presently, 
that's a funding source. That is something separate and distinct from uh, anything else by way of funding. And I just, I've been around too long, but I remember I was part of all of this back in 1996, and it's something that I think uh, the county should consider as well, because uh, the city of New York, if it's brought to the attention of, of uh, people at DEP, uh, the, uh, the extent of and the frequency of, of failing septics, that is a very fertile source of funding. So I'm just mentioning it, uh, but it doesn't happen unless people really push it. Thank you. Yes. To, to comment on Mr. O'Rourke's statement, we have had the DEP attend our meetings, and they are very interested in, in knowing that these septics have failed, and because it is an environmentally sensitive corridor, they, they have been involved, and they are encouraging encouraging us to move forward, and I believe that uh, there will be opportunity for a lot of grants down the road for the construction of this. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Come on. <clears throat> My name is Claire McLean, and I am on Route 6. And just because a septic system was built in 1973 does not mean that it failed, and that, is it a, that it is a failure because of its age. If the 70% is related to the failure reported to the, the Board of Health, is that the case? That's my first question. Were they total failures, or are you determining failure on the year 1973? Well, I'd like to see that truly determined. It isn't exactly that it will fail, it's that they're outdated. Well, outdated, out of, you're telling me out of the 170 of them could be all bad, right? Fail, failure or their age is, is compromised. I don't think that's what we said. Okay. At any rate, you also have building buildings that have spent a great deal of fortune with the planning board for new septics. And all of the new shopping centers have had to go through very extensive septic uh, yeah. built se septic systems to accommodate our rule. Also, you're talking about building either on the railroad bed, which you already have for a trail, a septic system or a rail and or a railroad that will be interesting to see if you're putting this on the road you are also going through DEP DEC um, properties and are you as a county um, required to do the state permits in order to build or or disturb the area along that route we would be subject to those permits and we are part you are subject to the permit Paul, would you get up the mic and respond so the public can hear it as well? Just speak into the mic. I'm sorry. Mic. So want, great. He wants your voice. Yeah. Go on. We're partnering with the DOT, the DEP, and the DEC. Um, and they, they are assisting us with, uh, they will assist us with any uh, permits down the road. But we will, we will be required to get the permits. And the reason you've picked this road is because Dan Barry has said it's a great idea? Okay, because um, there's really not a lot there. Downtown Booster sounds a lot more important. Will each business have to pay for the hookup to this system ind independently, or will that also be in your construction costs? It's too preliminary to know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I just want to make a quick comment that uh, there's a property. Oh, my name is Tyler Tremblay. Um, there's a property uh, where Polos and the Four and a Half used to be uh, that's owned by my family. And the uh, building was designed, uh, actually with the Falchetti's group, uh, was designed, was approved to some extent. Uh, the biggest setback was the septic. Uh, we could not build a septic the size uh, that could support the building. And the DEP came in after everything was pretty much settled and uh, shut the project down. Uh, there is a huge economic uh, opportunity on Route 6 to make Route 6 a more developed area 
and uh, this sewer line would really help that. We'd be able to build buildings, we'd be able to build things to serve the county and the town of Southeast using a great road, Route 6, four lanes, uh, that 22 fa frankly couldn't support because of the traffic that's already there. Um, it's a good connection between Danbury businesses and, and New York businesses, so I just wanted to make that comment that we've already had trouble with septics and a lot of businesses on Route 6 are already looking at why would we spend 50, 60, 70, 100 thousand dollars on a septic system where we could potentially have something that is greater from Danbury. So, Thank you. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Peter Scott. I'm a landowner on six. I'm also an engineer that does work in the area. Yeah, I, I think it's been, a, it's been a long time coming uh, to get a sewer in. Uh, we did a lot of work on Mill Plain Road and the pipes were too small. At that portion of the sewer mains, we had to do off-peak pump stations on all those hotels and uh, shopping centers right before the border. So it's not only uh, uh, a requirement of a sewer main in our side of the road, but the pipes are too small on the Danbury side, so there's going to be a lot of, there's some improvement requirements uh, which will be needed for pipe sizing just to get the flow over to the, to the center. A couple things also is uh, locating the sewer main. Uh, well, the sewer main has to be near the frontage of the lots because we want to gravity feed to the sewer main itself with all the existing properties along the strip. So putting a sewer main on the railroad right away, uh, you could do that as a pump station to return the flow, but somehow you have to gather all the flows up and, and within Route 6. So you have to think about that use of the uh, railroad right away uh, as only a return line, but not a collection line for the, for the source. The last question I have is, you know, if you, I, I brought with me the SR6 permitted uses uh, what zoning is allowed on that strip. Uh, and because the new zoning allows, everything's a special permit use. There's no approved uses on the site. And in fact, sewer is, only, is really good for like restaurants, grocery stores, multiple family. Uh, and in terms of the zoning allowed, the only multiple family allowed now is a senior housing by special permit. Uh, you are, uh, it does allow uh, restaurant uses but how many restaurants are you going to put on Route 6? Uh, they, uh, the high demand water uses, if the sewer did come through, I think uh, myself included, would like to have an expansion of the zoning to allow multiple family. It seems to be the big driver uh, in, a, in our economy and other economies in the area, especially we're doing all of them in Danbury, we're doing them in Bethel, uh, we're even doing in the village of Brewster, we're doing multiple family. Uh, and again, if you have sewer, that's typically what takes place. So I think if we're considering a sewer main, uh, I think we should look at the zoning allowed in the SR6 zone as well, and maybe make it more apropos to what the uh, demands are in the area itself. It's a great idea. I wish you guys moved faster. I mean, someday I have to retire, and if I have to wait for the sewer main to come, I may be, uh, I may be on, uh, being wheeled in here to get the project approved. But uh, if we could maybe move things along a little bit, guys, it'd be great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming this yes. evening. Thank you. Okay. I make a motion to go into the work session portion. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Next is Ace Indigo Road Alignment Site Plan. Good evening, Councilwoman, Council, Mr. Supervisor. Thank you for hearing us. Um, my name is Michael Endico. Um, I'm one of the owners of my family business, Ace Endico. We're up on International Boulevard. Um, just a quick background, if you don't know, we uh, acquired the property back in 2002. We moved into our building in 2005. Um, when we moved into our building, we had roughly 89 employees. Today, in 2019, we have 465 employees. Um, we take great pride in being in Putnam County in Southeast. We try to be a good neighbor. We uh, try to keep the property clean, beautiful, as beautiful as we can. Uh, something we're proud of, we just got voted a great place to work 
I think that's why uh, we attract a lot of employment. Um, our business is, uh, we need to be very efficient in our business, so that's why we're proposing uh, moving the road and adding on to the building instead of using the three approved buildings across the street. We did acquire the land across the street from us about three years ago. And the way the plan is drawn up now, and we'll, we'll bring it up and show it, is there's three buildings approved across the street and then our existing building. If there is a way to move the street, add on to our existing building, um, it would be much more efficient. We're, we're a food service distributor and we pick orders to be delivered to restaurants, hotels, some supermarkets. And to have separate buildings for separate portions of business would be very difficult for us. We are in a growth mode. Um, this would help us tremendously. Um, currently, our tax base, we pay a little north of 500000 in taxes. And uh, we estimate that we'd pay, at today's rate, over 750000 in taxes um, with this expansion. Most of our traffic, because that is a question that comes up, our trucks leave between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Um, we, do, we do pick orders at night, so a lot of, uh, a portion of employment comes in at night. Our traffic pretty much goes down International Boulevard onto 84 east and west, probably 95% of it. Um, We, we also do not go on Zimmer Road except for emergencies. That was part of the original approval of the building. Uh, and we have some drawings to show. If I could present it to you, um, you can guys come up. Yeah, Mike comes off if you'd like to, when you Thank put you. your posters up. If you want to kind of show the audience too, that's fine. I'm going to direct it to only the audience. I'm going to give up this. This is a. Uh, I'm going to walk around. As uh, Michael had said, uh, Ace Endico has been a, a tremendous company in this in this community for some years, and uh, and quite frankly, it needs to be expanded a bit. Um, we are proposing this is the existing condition plan. I'm going to pull out my uh, little pointer here, and what we're trying to do, um, Michael, there are three lots in this area you know, under the existing conditions that Michael had bought, all developable with, with buildings on them, all approved. There's a stormwater system to the bottom of this property. This is 84 as you approach the 312 intersection and you come through International Road here and Zimmer Road is on the back. Um, what we'd like to do as Michael has basically approached us and said, well, we want to expand the business. We want to develop these properties. Um, actually, John Lepler came up with the idea of expanding the building, not developing these properties, and expanding the building, which makes a more practical sense in terms of the, the operations of the building and how it's going to, how it's going to work. Having said that, um, what we want to do is relocate International Boulevard uh, to come down through this area, which were the old building sites of what Michael's giving up, and basically coming down through, which I'll show you on the approved, on the proposed plan. And that's why we're here tonight, is that we wanna, we're gonna need your board's approval for the relocation of this road, which basically International Boulevard was up through this area here. So essentially the building gets expanded um, in this area. Um, there was previously approved and part of the approval of the original Ace Endico was this building, this part. So that's gonna be an expansion. So between this, this, and we're also contemplating a parking garage in this area. Having said that, we would 
locate uh, International Boulevard lower on the property, uh, forego all the building that could have happened on this property, keep the stormwater that's already in place, and basically, um, and there's another parking area that's already been constructed in this area. Well, I don't think we need that. So we're basically more or less condensing it back into the site as opposed to expanding to different areas, what have you. Um, some preliminary discussions we talked about berming and putting in landscaping along the International Boulevard, which certainly can be done. Um, you know, if, personally, if you're driving, and my kids are up in Rochester right now, so I drive this road very frequently. And if you're looking over to the right and you're driving, you shouldn't be looking there, um, quite frankly, but that's my opinion. Having said that, uh, nonetheless, we're, we're going to screen this from the 84 corridor, from inter the new International Boulevard, also from Zimmer Road on the backside. This is the ball field back on Zimmer. So where did, it come, where did it come out before? Right up there? Right okay. now it comes up here. And, how, and where's Holmes Road? Um, down here. Okay. So basically just realigning the whole corridor um, and making it best for both ACE and quite frankly I think from a from a planning st uh, standpoint, it makes sense for the whole project. Um, with us tonight is Ted Cutler. I'd like to uh, have him just go through a couple plans in terms of architecture. And we're, we're talking about green roofs. We're talking about uh, some other things, features that Mike wants to employ in this. If you ever went out to Ace Endico, you'll see the picnic tables and what have you. We think we can make that more extraordinary in terms of the overall plan. The bottom line in the end, what will you be coming to the town board seeking? Besides uh, re re relocation of the road. That's it? I believe so. That's a town board action. Okay. Ultimately, we'll be back. We're, we're planning on going to the planning board right after this meeting and, and starting that process. Have you, start, have you gone to them with this? We've, we've had preliminary discussions with them, but this is this is going to be the start of the of that process. Um, I I believe in a quick question that, um, and you are a very good neighbor, and we're happy to have you here. Um, but are you going to? Will this be? Will you be going for more uh, the pilot program on this? Uh, most, likely not. most likely not. Okay, not because that's something we have some say in. Well, so thank you. Um, this is Ted Cutler of uh, Tecton. He'll be walking you through some of the elevations and things worth looking at in terms of the building and, and what it looks like from, from various locations. Thank you, Tim. Can I actually borrow your uh, pointer? Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. With the full build out, without the pro pilot program, if it's up, the tax it will probably be over a million dollars. Okay. on the full build out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ted Cutler, Tecton Architects. It's uh, good to be here again and good to represent the architecture at this early stage. Uh, so we have two case studies on, on the board and I, I'll share them since they're facing the public. I have smaller okay. copies to pass along there. Essentially we've, we've looked into uh, various data uh, from GPS to Google Maps to uh, public data and private data of, of all International Drive to map out the profile, viewing angle, and the actual view from 84. And uh, this is eastbound because westbound is very difficult to actually look up over the, the grades as you, you round the corner. So what, we, what we've have here. First of all, as a starting point, buildings up there now are visible. Very faintly, but you can see buildings up there if you're careful on the highway. Uh, so let's look at the proposed case here, adding to the existing 
uh, Ace Endico building. So you can see there is a, a faint line behind the tree line and it is about 850 feet away from westbound traffic and even further from the eastbound side which is your viewing angle. So um, the, the finishes of this building would be very similar to what they are now. It's an off-white um, high performance metal panel for cool, cold and frozen goods storage and uh, it, it tends to blend right into the the um, colors along the highway there, particularly when the leaves fall. That color blends into the sky and to the trees, the bare trees. So the visibility uh, in this case uh, will be marginally increased given the grades and the viewing angle. Incidentally, it's approximately, uh, let's see, 110 vertical feet to get to the floor line and even higher to that roof line. So you're, you're not just looking over, you're looking up from the highway. The second case study is the three approved buildings, pre-approved buildings lined up on the other side of the current International Drive. What you see there is, is as realistic a forecast as we can come up with is a much more prominent building. The largest of the three would be the closest to the highway and uh, on the most um, open from a vegetation standpoint. Um, so that uh, incidentally is, is uh, clearly more visible in this case. But these buildings, uh, as they should be, are designed to face International Drive and front there and service clients and visitors from that side. Their back of house is facing the highway. So um, while Ace Indico is really going to have a a pristine presence and manicured front front lawn, et cetera, as they do now, if you haven't been up there recently, um, these buildings will have their back of house and service yards facing the highway and closer to the highway by almost 200 feet. So just quickly, I wanted to move on from that. And at this early stage, the building uh, is not completely designed. However, it's important to note that while we're sensitive to the fact that the buildings along the highway may not want to be obtrusive, at some point as you arrive to the site, it's going to be seen and, and it, they want it to be seen. Ace Endico is very proud of their brand. They're proud of their presence in the community but in the region as a growing business. So there will be um, certainly new, new landscaping, uh, new vegetation, some screening as Tim had mentioned. However, there will be a, an expanded facility and a brand presence when you arrive there. Are there any questions or any follow-up? Right, okay. So there's been talk of a uh, green roof as well, which is a, a perfect opportunity, especially with an expansion because... Right, right. That would be uh, very nice. And with the expansion, that that's far more plausible than going back and reinforcing existing structure to hold a green roof capacity there. So, and then there is uh, one of the most sustainable first steps in any development project is to stack your program. So one one layer of elevated parking would, would occur near the office expansion. So essentially in that zone, you're doubling the parking with half the pervious surface. And a lot of those cars are sheltered from the heat. Uh, you're reducing some of the heat gain that would reflect into the, into the building and essentially marginally lowering, lowering your energy costs in the building. So it's a very sustainable step just to structure some of the parking as well. Any other thoughts on the, on the building? Okay. Okay. Um, I have questions, of course. Um, it, hearing about the green roof always sounds wonderful, but I've been so tortured with this over the years, and it just never seems to get done. So I hope I, I hope it does become a reality on that. This, but will you be adding more retail? The retail will stay the same size, roughly same. the same size. Roughly the same. Okay. And will the um, 
basins, the stormwater basins that are in now, will those work for the additions or will those have to be enlarged? Do we know? Uh, we don't anticipate it right now. It's all DEP approved. Okay. And quite frankly, between the swap of the, the previous property that was approved and what's already been done out the site, we believe that the stormwater basins can be left alone. Um, so, so subject to talking right. to the DEP, but otherwise we think it's uh, it'll be fine. Okay, and that won't be our purview, but I always am Well, it'll be the planning board's purview, planning board. so exactly. yes. Exactly, also, um, would it be possible at some point when you're ready for members of the town board who are interested to walk, or, and or planning board, we can combine it to walk the property? Absolutely. That would be great, because we I would love to see where this is really gonna sure. to go. And then I'm the other thing that I'm tough on is, as you know, is how the finished product looks. So, um, and I know you're not. Re I know a lot of this is preliminary, but after walking the property, I think it would give. Uh, I'd be really interested and would give me a much better idea. So I really appreciate that. Great. Thank you. Um, it's a, it's a already a wonderful facility. You know, if you look at it now, and it's only going to be. I, I, in, in knowing Ted and knowing what Mike really wants to put into this building, it's just going to be—it's going to be incredible. It's just going to be much that better, and the tax base and everything else is going to be something that's—it's a—it's a win-win for everybody. Okay. Believe me. I'd be happy to take anyone through the building to the building, inside, outside. Great. We're, we're I think what proud. would be really helpful and save you a lot of time is if we organize this with the planning board. We've done it for other large projects and. Um, we can't have a quorum go, but th this tends to work out if, and is going to be easier on you, I think. So okay, I'd be, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, the parking lots that you just put in um, on the 84 side, will this road make those? Um, that, that parking double? lot would disappear. The road would probably be where the, the road would be where the parking lot is now. Okay, um, and uh, you're going to have to pay for the. Uh, Correct. Road, of course. And Correct. And the utilities and whatever else needs to be done. And traffic will continue to just use Independent Boulevard. Uh, no, no use of Zimmer Road. No, we do not. I mean, in an emergency, we'd have to use Zimmer Road, but we do not use Zimmer Road currently. Do any of your neighbors, other um, businesses on uh, Unilock mm -hmm. and the others, do they use Zimmer Road, or will they ha have a need to go on this new section? Well, well, that basically what, what I see, I do see cars pass through that section. Right. I don't see uh, Unilock going on that road. Um, maybe employees to and from Unilock or Westchester Tractor, but no, I don't. I'm just wondering if it's going to um, inconvenience them during the construction phase as well. We, we would, the way I would like to do it is I'd like to build as much of the road as possible with, with the proper perm permission. Once that road is complete, then shut our road down. Okay. We, I would for our own use and everyone's use, I wouldn't want to uh, block that road at all. Great, thank you. Thank you. Now the road is a road. If you're coming and yeah. going toward Carmel, I shoot up Zimmer Road yeah. and go that way. And if I'm coming from Carmel, I'd go in by the light because it's a lot more convenient. So people use the road. No, I just wanted to traffic yeah. or if, if businesses were using well, but it that way. Yeah. I'm quite, <clears throat> look at from time to time, they might go that way depending on which way they're going. Cool. If it's up to town spec, so that yeah. won't matter. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's a road. I, th I think this is a really neat project. So thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy you guys are here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for your time. Okay. And Thanks. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to make a motion now. To, on. to wrap up, I, I think oh. probably the flag board will, will declare us all the agency as we get to the before them. Please get to the mic back. again a little bit. Yeah. You don't mind. Just uh, process-wise, uh, we're here before you, obviously representing this and, and moving the road. But uh, process-wise, we we assume that the planning board will take lead agency. We'll be back to you at some point with a referral from them back to this board for the relocation of the road. Mm -hmm. right. So that's that's the process we're we're moving forward. <clears throat> to. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Have a good evening. Okay, make a motion to go into the regular portion of the meeting. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. First item on the agenda there is resolution of water and sewer district use policy. Resolved that the town board hereby adopts the town of Southeast water and sewer special district use policy dated 9-12-19, a copy of which is annexed here too, which establishes the procedure for connection to the district improvements and regulations for all water and sewer districts in the town 
and be further resolved that any subsequent change that will affect the number of parcels within each district identified below and or any new districts created after this policy goes into effect shall require notification in writing to the town's accounting department, assessor's office, building department, and special districts department. In the special water districts, we have Birch Hill Water, 24, well, I'll call them parcels, units, Blackberry Water, 252, Brewster Heights, 396, Hillcrest Water, 129, Fox Hill Water, 33, Mountain Brook Water, 44, Peaceful Hill Water, 154, Springhouse Estates Water, 54, Star Ridge Water, 98. Special Sewer Districts, Blackberry Sewer, 252, Brewster Heights Sewer, 396, Peach Lake Sewer, 120. And allegedly, you're not gonna see 100 on Route 6. That'll be a county one, hopefully. And be further resolved that this policy will go into effect immediately. And just to further on this, uh, we've had these uh, districts for quite some time, 40, 50 years. We could not find any hard concrete policy. This way, everyone is treated equally. The more units they have, the less they pay, of course. The less they have, the more they pay. But everyone will be consistent percentage-wise, proportionally. I'd like to uh, second this for discussion. Discussion. Um, I just, I do want to thank you, and I know LaVon put a lot of work into this, and I think having consistency in this is much fairer for our residents and probably was overdue. So thank you, Tony. Okay. Thanks, Tony. Yeah, thank welcome. you. Now, um, this policy would be passing tonight and it will go into effect with the next uh, billing that goes out on October. Some people will be in for, um, well, not a shock. Some people who start paying, who are paying before will be paying nothing because vacant parcels. Right. Um, I am gonna try to make a fairness. Some of these people have been paying into the district for quite some time and I'm gonna to look to give them some kind of a credit. You know, it would be like on the, on the books if something happens in the future and they have to go back into the unit. That would they paid over the years, some of that would be refunded. Not refunded, be accredited right. to them if they ever going through it, just to be fair. Right. Yeah, that would, in, in the event that they needed to hook up, yeah. that would yeah. be a credit. Some people have been paying for maybe 20 years. Yeah. So we'll give them a credit how much they paid in because we can figure that out right. and they'll be given that credit. Yeah. But we don't refund money. Right, okay. so you'll have an equal kind of formula made. Yeah, there's, there's not many, but there are people. Again, some vacant parcels, like I said, when we went through this, we found vacant parcels that were paying, vacant parcels that weren't paying. We had people that were in the district with wells that weren't paying, and people in the district with wells that were paying. So everyone is now gonna be consistent. So people who didn't get a bill in the past will be getting one. We made like a minimum charge for the paperwork at the minimum, and uh, it's, it's something that was definitely necessary. Will you be coming back with a formula for how you're going to credit those people? I could, it's, it's, it's gonna because, be pretty simple. Yeah, only because it, that way, since we're making everything up to date now, this is like story. It, well, it, there'll be a record of it. Yeah, yes. we could add it easily, and, yeah. and then it would be consistent for yeah. everyone. Okay. That would be great, okay. but this is good Thanks. now. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. I need a second, Tony. No, I, no, I second it for discussion, oh, okay. Michelle, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. you missed that. <laughs> she said, no, yes. I thought I was pretty loud as <laughs> usual. <laughs> Jeez. Okay, number two, resolution award a contract for a block building demolition. Now, therefore, be resolved that Town Board of Town Southeast hereby accepts the proposal of James Gagliardo excavating and hereby authorizes supervisor to execute a personal service contract with James Gagliardo excavating for the demolition of the block building located in the gold lot, Main Street, Bristol, New York, and removal of demolition debris associated herewith and be further resolved that this resolution shall take effect immediately. So move for discussion. I'll second. Uh, we hope to get this done um, either the last week in September, first week in October, the building is pretty much unsafe and I'll be putting forward a proposal in the future, what we, I would like to see done with it and the board will have to discuss accordingly. Can I, uh, okay, so we're going to have to get the stuff out of the building before. It's gone. It's gone. It's Everything, already out. Everything's gone. The only thing we're waiting for is the uh, New York State Electric Gas to remove the uh, power to it. Can I ask what the process was as far as going out for bids? Were the bids? We, we put it out in the press and... Were they all received and opened at the same time or...? Not necessarily, no. They came into my office. They were all confidential though. Okay. Yeah. Just we had a date by which they came. Some people came in early, some came in late. And they were widespread. The highest amount was close to 50,000 
and two came in within four hundred dollars of one yeah, another. Yeah, that's why. That's that was pretty interesting that they weren't that close. Oh, well, they didn't start off that way. By the time he added the extras, one person wanted more to do some additional extras, and the person wanted less. The one that was shocking was the fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. So it, they were all complete bids when they came in, or did we have to go back and ask them for additional nope. information? No. Nope. What we did, we put together a package, and everyone got the same sheet. It was forwarded to them all on the same day, and they filled it out accordingly. They did come in individually. We didn't have a, a sealed bid, so to speak. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, number three, resolution Batista Southeast Duncan Bond Establishment. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the bond amount is hereby established for the project set forth below. Project name, Batista Southeast Duncan. Erosion Sediment Control Bond, 14200 And be further resolved that a certified copy of this resolution shall be transmitted by the clerk, town clerk to the applicant, planning board secretary, and building inspector forthwith. So move for discussion. A second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Public comment. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> once again, Richard O'Rourke, this time as an attorney on behalf of Barrett Hill Associates, LLC. And uh, I'm here tonight to comment on a phone conversation and call I received yesterday from the planning board chairman. This was yesterday. Uh, informing me that the application for final site plan approval with respect to uh, Barrett Hill Associates was being removed from the agenda of September 23rd. It had been placed on the agenda based upon a submission that was received in a timely fashion and for it to be considered on September 23rd. I was informed that the reason for it being pulled from the agenda was because there had been uh, ex an expiration of the special permit that had been granted in December of 2017. As a result of that, I, of course, this was yesterday, so I'm here tonight. Uh, and I sent to each of you via email a copy of a letter setting forth our position, uh, citing case law, as well as the circumstances surrounding uh, this special permit grant and its um, the assertion that we should be pulled from the planning board agenda uh, because of its expiration. I don't want to read this in, in its entirety. I don't think you want me to read it. I'm sure you will read it. And I would suggest also that you speak with counsel regarding what, what was said. Um, and I think the important thing, there's, there's, a couple, there's a couple elements to this. One is that as far as the, uh, the assertion that that the request for the extension is untimely. Uh, I cited to a, a particular case that was decided um, in the Supreme Court, the state of New York, Westchester County, uh, in 2017, and that's the case of Picucci versus the town of Newcastle, Chappaqua. And uh, in that particular case, the um, Supreme Court determined that on those facts, where a request was made for an extension uh, more months beyond the period of time when we have requested the extension, that uh, it was appropriate to grant the extension. And the fact that the request was not made prior to the alleged expiration of the special permit, that um, nevertheless the permit should be, um, uh, should special permit should be extended. I'm familiar with that case because it was my firm that handled it, and so we're well familiar with the law in that regard. But I think the important thing is that that court also cited to the New York State Court of Appeals case, Town of Orangetown versus McGee, in which the court stated, the Court of Appeals, the highest court in the state of New York stated, to that end, the Court of Appeals has stated that a vested right can be acquired when pursuant to a legally issued permit. The landowner demonstrates a commitment to the purpose for which the permit was granted by effectuating and effecting substantial changes and incurring substantial expenses to further the development. 
That is precisely what happened here. And I go on to, to cite, and I have the, the emails, um, there was a cooperative effort in good faith by the applicant who then filed back, back uh, I'm trying to give you the precise date, I don't want to make a mistake here, uh, July 9, 2018, uh, the application for site plan approval was timely filed with the planning board. Fees were paid. It was timely filed in, within the framework and time frame of the special permit, which was 18 months. After discussions with the planning board and uh, emails which we have, it was decided the planning board in good faith said, listen, what you really should do is work with the DEP, get your approvals because we know that uh, the rigid and stringent regulations of the DEP may in fact, may in fact uh, alter the site plan application. In response to that, the, planning, the, the, the applicant said, okay, we're going to work with the planning board. So that application, timely filed, was put on a suspense calendar while the applicant then went and dealt with the other boards and agencies. And thereafter, and it was on August 27th, which is what, three weeks ago, the planning board site plan application was reactivated because the DEP granted its approval of the final plans on August 27th. And it was on August 29th, two days later, the applicant immediately reactivated the application. That was the application put in, in a timely fashion for it to be considered at the September 23rd, 2019 planning board meeting. Yesterday afternoon, we were told it was being removed because the special permit had expired. I've laid it out. The applicant has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, went through more than six very carefully planned submissions with the DEP to get through the approval process and now has that and now has timely filed the application with the planning board. So I'm here tonight because of the phone call received yesterday, yesterday afternoon from the planning board chairman, stating that the planning board will not consider the application until the special permit is extended. I am unaware of, and the case law is here, uh, the special permit should be extended um, and I'm suggesting respectfully that it should be extended immediately so that this application can be heard as it was submitted, properly so, on, for the September 23rd meeting. At risk is hundreds of thousands of dollars that have been spent since the issuance of the special permit and because the applicant cooperated with the planning board's wishes. Well, Rick, as you know, you had sent that out earlier today. It was I heard rumors of this. I think Ashley Lai from AKRF made us aware in an email that the service permit had expired. The determination was made, and I guess that's why it was taken off the plan the board agenda. Um, I spoke to council earlier this evening as well. Um, is, this is not that it was a controversial plan that came forward but it passed three to two. And the board makeup since that point in time is not, it's three to two in, in a sense of membership, but I know I had voted against that at the time. And I buy the argument, I have no problem approving it again, but I voted no. And I'm not sure why I'd have to change my vote to yes. So I'm gonna have to check on council how I have to vote. I'm gonna tell you my biggest concern on this whole thing and because we just got this, you just covered for me saying why I'm not prepared this evening to answer any of the questions. I want to go back and look and see what was said in those reports because I understand now there's a tremendous problem up there with water. And we were told, I believe, uh, I, probably, uh, I believe what I read said there was sufficient water at the time for both Fieldstone Pond and this project. And I have since learned in the two years since the special permit was issued that there's not enough water for Fieldstone Pond. So I don't think this will be ready for the next meeting. I don't know. I'm gonna have to do some re research and soul searching on my part, 
but I'm going to have to check into and find out what the town board was told for the special permit, what the planning board was told for that special permit, and if there's a problem with the water, I'm going to have to go back. And I would like to ask one question if it could be answered this evening. How long ago did American Water uh, take this project over? You know, you and I. Not the project, but the water. Right. Okay. The uh, I I could I spoke on the phone with uh, Larry Nadel, who was the principal that sold the water company to New York American Water. Uh, he did not have the file in front of him, but his estimate was that it was at least four or five years ago that the company was sold. I know you thought it was more recently than that, but it was sold four or five uh, uh, years ago. And that's subject to confirmation. We can, you can look yeah. at the records. I mean, that's, it, but that's, that's the story. But I think that the, the important thing, though, and, and I've seen some of the correspondence concerning the water. The water is, <laughs> is everyone's problem, but it's the problem of the water company. It's the problem of the water company. Now, if that is something that, whether it's this project or any other project, if you have a private utility that is providing services and it is in a service area approved by the Public Service Commission, whether it's electricity or it's water or it's sewer, there is that affirmative obligation for it to be provided. My point in saying that is that's, with all due respect, the problem of the water company. And clearly, this board, the planning board, anyone, without even stating it, but it can always be conditioned upon that all of the utilities uh, properly serve uh, this development, um, and that's a condition of the approval, or the condition of the extension of a special permit, or a condition of the final site plan approval. I have no objection to that. It's common sense, it makes sense, and we want it because otherwise we can't build. We can't, even if we got a building permit, we couldn't get a certificate of occupancy. So uh, with all due respect, that is something that obviously, that is the water company's concern. It is the water company's issue to solve. And I represented Heritage Hills for the last 30 years, the water company and the sewer company. Wells, wells fail. More wells have to be drilled. Sewer plants have problems. There's notices of violation. They have to be fixed. The same, this happens all the time when you have, if you have a water system that is approved by the Public Service Commission, it's not static. It's not like you've got to stick with the same wells and the same well yield. You have to provide the services for which you were granted that permissive service area. My point in saying that is, with all due respect, that's not a basis to deny the extension of a special permit. As a matter of law, I'll take that to the bank. You'll have the case law. I don't know whether everyone has a copy of the letter. I have additional copies. If we you do. need, does anybody need an additional copy? Okay. No, I agree. Um, and I, I'd be pleased to discuss this. We want to work cooperatively. We don't, we don't necessarily, we'd rather work cooperatively with something like this. And, um, and frankly, I could, I could bore you with statistics for why this project uh, makes so much sense. Uh, I, in fact, I spoke today with Barbara Barossa, uh, who is, as you know, the planner in uh, Putnam County. Because I, what, I, what I wanted to find out from Barbara, what, is, what in fact is the median income in Putnam County? This is very, very important. The median income in Putnam County right now, and this is the email from Barbara Barossa, Per our conversation today, Putnam County's median household income is $99,608. You may recall the, this, this special permit allows for affordable housing and to qualify the salaries, um, the salary has to be less than and up to 80% of what the median income is. What that is is $79,686.40. By way of illustration, and I think this is extremely important. My firm represents over 30 school districts. I have the salaries of the school districts in our surrounding area. The Pauling Central School District, the Arlington Central School District, the Carmel Central School District, the North Salem Central School District, 
the Brewster Central School District. And I'll start with Brewster. If you have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree and you are employed with the Brewster School District, that's a bachelor's plus master's degree. The starting salary is $64,000. It is after eight years when a teacher in the Brewster School District no longer qualifies for a unit based on affordable housing. One of the reasons why we went forward with this is Kenny Clare, commissioner. He, can't get, he doesn't have volunteer fire department members. He can't get them. So we're, we're, the problem is you have to face the harsh realities of what's going on, and that's why this special permit should be renewed. Lastly, and I'll give you a very detailed report in two weeks when it will be released by Pattern for Progress. What you have to realize is what's happening in the Hudson Valley, and unfortunately, most of New York State. We are getting old. There's no young people that are moving in here. Speak for yourself. <laughs> I'll, I'll speak for myself, but just for uh, statistical purposes, the percent change, okay, in 20 to 39-year-olds in Putnam County from 2000 to 2007, 8.5% drop. From 2000 to 2010, a drop of 18.2%. From 2000 to 2017, by 13.7%. Young people are not living here because they cannot afford it. This is based on the U.S. Census Bureau, uh, the Centennial Census, and the American Community Survey of 2017. I'm not making this stuff up. We got to consider this as a community, and that's the reason why we did what we did, and I'm respectfully requesting that this special permit be extended. Great. And again, my concern, going back to when, I heard all that argument then. I, I'm part of workforce housing. I qualify for almost all of my work for the government. I'm old. I'm military, whatever thing. Uh, my problem is, was the town board and the planning boards given, given misinformation? Not maybe, regarding the water. Regarding the water. They, okay. I got to find out what did they tell us? Because now they said when they came in, we don't have enough water. We're going to put a X gallon of tank. But we found out things in the past two years that there's a problem with the water. And I'm, I'm, I'd almost bet you now that it's been in the past two years. And if it's been five or four or five years, like you're saying, I think I better leave now because time is flying way too fast. So well, I'm just going to check. I, I hear what you're saying. I just I have to check and see what was said in the presentations to get their approvals. I think that's, that's very easy. Uh, we'll find out what the minutes have said at the public hearing, the representations that were made. Ms. Eckhart? Yeah. Well, I, I do. I right. do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Supervisor, if I can make two comments to yourself and the board. I will request in our office all corporate documents on the Mount Ebo water system be provided to council and in turn to your council in a complete fashion. The transaction and the conveyance to American Water approximately five years ago. All documentation will be provided tomorrow to Mr. O'Rourke and on to Mr. Stevens and yourselves. Nothing will be redacted. We learned of the issue of water supply literally contemporaneously with the town officials and town consultants. We had no knowledge prior to their coming before the boards. I had a call today from council and I've asked for the formal documentation directed to you and the planning board from American Water. But from the point of the conversation today, and I'd like to see the documentation, the redevelopment of the existing wells, the additional drilling, hydrofracking, hydrofracking, and testing that's been complete has now addressed all open issues 
in terms of capacity and quality for all existing customers of Mount Ebo, Fieldstone, Pond, Stonecrest, all the commercial buildings. Plus Barrett Hill? They now have the capacity that is twice the daily capacity with your best well out of service. That was this afternoon at about 4.30. I've asked for that documentation. That documentation has already been submitted, I've been told, to the Putnam County Health Department, the State Health Department, and the New York State DC. American Water went on notice when they had a problem. They've addressed it diligently. I got that information this afternoon at 4.30. Is Bear Hill included in those numbers? Do you know? No. no. To my knowledge, it is not. It is the existing customers, is the way I was, it was explained to me. I do not know what excess capacity the existing wells that they now have online, or if you will, uh, redevelop. I do not know the excess capacity. The statement was made, we've met, we've met that. The application to drill an additional well through the guidance of WSP, the hydrogeologist for American Water, that's pending right now with the planning board, is in an area where they expect the yield to more than meet the requirement for Barrett Hill without touching any of the existing capacity. And we know exactly what the demand is for that. Well, once, once, I, once I see that and research it, I might be happier, but until I see it, I'll take I, it. I will, I've asked that that documentation be provided by American Water. I will see that Mr. O'Rourke has what he needs for a transmittal to your board, the planning board, and town council, and anyone else you wish to direct it, uh, that information to, and nothing will be withheld. Okay. You'll Can also I have the time period, not only of the transfer to American Water, since I was part of the ownership, but I go back to the original ownership with Mount Ebo, which was somewhat after 1981 when we started this project, 1981. And we built the water and the sewer. Um, I have one quick question on that while you're talking about the whole district. Is the temple in that water district or is that a separate? Every building there, including the temple, is in the water district and the sewer district, okay. as well as providing fire protection to every resident and every building. Okay. Um, I understand the temple's on the market. I'm just concerned. Um, if I'm, it, so am I, and I am concerned about commercially usage. and personally for what's occurred. Okay. That's, um, a, that's a whole different subject. No, no. I, and I, I, my I, understanding as of two nights ago from the board of directors of that institution is that transfer has not occurred. And I stood up publicly in front of 100 people, and I said, take it to the Attorney General's office and the State Banking Commission, because that's a travesty what's happened up there. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, I was only bringing it up as for a possible change of use, as far as water usage goes. That's a big deal. Right. State of use. It was, since I, I stood up on behalf of that organization to get the approval, it was specifically for the use as a house of worship, not a redevelopment as a commercial site or anything else. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Tony, I have a few okay. other things. We want to okay. ask them of Mr. Lepper um, or Mr. No, or? I can ask them and then it can, it's a jump ball for everyone. Um, as you know, I voted no originally um, because I was very concerned about the number of children that would be added to the school district. And interestingly, you mentioned how old our area is getting and I was, fine, I'd gotten used to the idea of the senior housing being there, but I don't see how in good conscience, and I understand, you know, that that you can't build if if there's not enough water, but I couldn't vote for something and, and worry about whether residents would have the water. And I also look if, to, to the future, because if this ends up being a poorly functioning district, that's how the town, and it won't be me, but it'll be someone else sitting here, and that's how we end up getting stuck with water districts that we don't want, that are malfunctioning, and that we end that people are disgruntled because they have to pay too much. So I don't think it's in 
the town's best interest to approve something until and unless we know that the water capacity is there. Um, and also, uh, the last thing I'll leave you with is really um, priority housing. Um, we were advised by our town planner at the time, and it did pass, and so be it, but that it really doesn't pass the smell test as far as being constitutional, because these aren't protected classes. So that's one other sticking point for me as far as um, what was done there. So Tony and I were the only ones on the board then, I know that. Um, uh, no, I'm sorry, Edwin was too, and Edwin voted in favor, but that, it, it's just something that I, I need a lot more answers before I can tackle this, so thank you. Um, I, had, I had a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so you wouldn't be here, and we wouldn't, wouldn't have gotten this letter today if you had filed for a special permit extension back on June 7th. Is that right? No. <laughs> well, obviously what would have happened um, is um, I don't think we would have changed your mind. No, if you went for a special no, permit because, back then? No, no, no. My point being this, insofar as the water is concerned, insofar as the water is concerned, as I've said, that is a problem that that water company has. I recognize and respect You're answering the, Lynn. You're not answering my question. Well, okay. I'm going to get there in a moment. Right. May I? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't interrupt you, so could I, could I finish? Yeah, yeah, please. Thank you very much. Thank well, you. No, well, I asked a question. Please, and please. You came up All right, no, no, I just, yeah. something else. Okay. If no. you wanted to answer Lynn, Jenny. you could have come up then. Okay, thank yeah. you. Well, I did. I came up now to answer that and to answer your question. You looked at me and you asked me a question. Right. And I'd like to answer it. Thank you. Okay. I don't think I would have changed your mind because, quite I don't frankly, know what my mind is right now. I, well, I, I have a sense. Thank you. Okay, I have a sense. And I guess my concern is this that with respect to the water issue, you don't have to believe what, I, what I've said, but as a matter of law, the issue with respect to the water, you have a private company that is a utility that has an affirmative obligation to provide water. That is an obligation that may require the drilling of new wells. I used the illustration of Heritage Hills over the last 30 years. Wells fail, new wells, are, new wells are drilled. That is something that happens with utilities. And they, find, they have to find water. That, that is the obligation. That, to me, with all due respect, based on what I know, is not a basis or a valid basis to deny an extension application. Now, with regard to the question of we wouldn't be here tonight requesting an extension. We certainly um, would have to have gotten an extension anyway, even if we were within the 18 months, um, because at 18 months, we didn't have site plan approval. Had we received the site plan approval during that period of time, then we would not have needed an extension. The reason we did not get the site plan approval, notwithstanding the fact we filed the application in a timely fashion, is because in good faith, it was the planning board that said, look, hold off. We want to see you get further down the road with the DEP so that we know exactly what, what this is going to look like. Shame on us. Yes. I mean, it, I guess because we, in good faith, we, in good faith, cooperated, worked collaboratively with the planning board. Okay, but my point is that if you had come in earlier to get the extension, knowing that the site plan approval had not been fulfilled, you know, we wouldn't really be having any of these discussions. We might later on with the issues that are coming up about the water, but, but this, I, I just think that if on June 7th, if you would file for that at that time, there wouldn't be as much of an issue right now. I, well, I think if we look at June 7th, by that point in time, the water issue had unfortunately come to light. And I think in addition to that, um, I would suggest to you that um, some of the objectives, not articulated by you, but by, um, by Ms. Eckhart, uh, would be the same objections in terms of the issue of 
of you know the multi multi-family workforce housing it would be the same it would be the same objections I, I think I mean I've, I've tried to I've tried to convince you that you know it actually helps our community because uh, based upon you know what the fire commissioner has said about the difficulties he has getting volunteers I've tried to show that with respect to some of the concerns about you know who who might possibly populate this I would hope that those teachers that would have the ability to rent a really brand new apartment at an affordable basis and I've demonstrated I can I can I'll, I'll, I'll supplement I'll, Rick, I'll, I, I don't I think you're missing my point is that I'm not against affordable housing I don't think you can discriminate about who gets affordable housing except for by their income or priority housing I'm not sure why a school teacher would be more worthy than a single mother who just doesn't have enough money so that was really my point and one of the reasons well she can apply too I'm just using it as an illustration I know but that, I that's don't, what I'm not suggesting you would take a school teacher over a, a single woman who doesn't is not making a, 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 enough money right I just don't not, think the preference groups in my eyes they do not seem constitutional it doesn't they're not protected classes seniors are even veterans which I don't understand but veterans are not a protected class so uh, we don't have to argue this now I, but and you know how I feel about this project so uh, we don't have to beat a dead horse but I'm trying to change your mind because I, well, I, I think it's a good thing because I think it's a good because I think it's a very good thing for the community that, that that's that's you know um that's what I think you know, Thank you. I have a daughter that could slide very easily into that, you know, into that affordable housing, and uh, I wish I wish it was available for her. I'm not looking for any priority or anything like that. I'm just. Can I have a copy just, of the letter? I'm sorry. Can I have a copy of the letter? I've got it on, on my. I've, I, I've, I've got here. I've got multiple copies. I got it right here. Okay. You want another copy? Thank you. I, can, I can print them out. You can, yeah. That's you fine. emailed them to us. We all have it on our computer. You all have it. If you I don't, you. let me know. No, I, I, Seriously. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And I, I didn't mean, I'm not, I'm just passionate about this because cool. I really, I really, not only do I think it's it's appropriate for the community, uh, but I think in terms of the extension, it was on my side. So. No, we're pa I'm passionate about making sure whoever comes in this community because believe me, mm -hmm. I have Springhouse Estates, I have Peaceable Hill, and we've inherited water districts, and we're going into something we now know, which we didn't know two years ago. Maybe the board would have voted the same way, I don't know. But if we knew that there was not sufficient water, even for the development that's there with a new one, I'm not sure they would have voted that way. Who knows? If you don't have water, you don't have life. I, well, and we're not, and as I've said, we could not get a building permit. We could not get a certificate of occupancy unless there was water. Okay. I mean, that's 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 the ultimate hook. So yep. we can't do that. I mean, we we that's and that's the condition that could be attached clearly. So thank anyway, you. Thank you very much. Okay. Have a good evening. Anyone else from the public? Town board. Um, good night now. I just wanted to say that e-waste uh, last weekend was a big success again. There were 55 residents brought things in. I want to thank John Lord, who worked the whole day there, which was yes. above and beyond the call. And the trailer is full, and we will be replacing it. So um, thanks to everyone so far who's been helping with the e-waste. And thanks to Eric, I should say, who came down and fixed the computer, too. So it broke down? Anyhow, it, yeah. So. I hear about that one. <laughs> no. So, um, despite everything, it was a big success. It was success. almost a quorum. Yeah, <laughs> it was almost a quorum. Thank God I fled. So, <laughs> anyhow, thank you all for uh, bringing your electronics in. So, can I ask something about e-waste? So, how, we've had it for three months now? Four. 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 And we filled up the container yes. with a little bit of overflow. So, I, I think we should probably keep it going like every month. Yes, I agree. I think it's been averaging. During the winter time, it's going to be a lot. Yeah, I'm concerned about the winter, but we can. I think but, it's been averaging around 50 people per yeah. Yeah, 50. per right. month, too. Um, and we also have to have three people there. I hope you agree with me there, finally. Not two? No, I like the two strong people, but I'm. Uh, it's is okay. There, this is going to be your baby, Tony. Is there a way we can be, get this aside no. to special districts it, or someone that should until be responsible? January 1st, because I didn't like. Jan the whole time, I don't blame you, you, and it shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. 
So right now, you have to wait till January 1st and we will have changes in the town. Right. Okay. Yeah, I think we have to look at everything and look at the winter months too, yeah. so. Can I ask some other that. questions? No. Um, <laughs> any update on the stall of landfill? You know, you try to steal all my thunder. I never, I don't do I've anything. I've got something else I'm going to steal too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Solar landfill, I've been working on it now no. for eight years. No, no, <laughs> really? the last five months. And I finally have uh, a template that I was able to use to make it work here for the town of Southeast. Levon is now reviewing it because he's the one who's gonna actually sign off on it and the end beside the town board, of course. Um, so I'm hoping to have it to you by, it won't be September 26th, probably the first meeting in October. I'll have the RFP available, seek the approval. We don't have to vote to send it out, you know, for, it's not gonna be an RFP, it'll be a real RFP, not like we did with the. Uh, Isn't that your birthday, September 26th? No, we're, no, we're not doing it then, okay? We're doing it in October. So I wanna make sure we get the whole thing together. Again, Levon's reviewing it. I'm gonna forward it to Will to make sure we kind of got all the T's crossed. Again, the first time we went out for it, it was a lot easier. Things have changed dramatically. Yeah. I didn't understand probably two thirds of the new terms that they're using, so I had to educate myself. And I'm, don't even ask me a question about it because I don't my cheat sheet. I couldn't tell you a thing about it. But at any rate, by October, I'll have it in front of the board in a work session to review. You can make comment and then we will put it on a bid net and whatever and seek uh, quotes to get it done. Do you want to comment before I steal your thunder again? Mm, no, I want to hear that. I might be able to steal some of yours. Okay. okay. Now, I wanted to ask about, I, I know you got that thing from Metro North, uh, the MTA, about the parking lot. Yes. And it's a five-year agreement. Can they, can they pull that at any time or no? Probably not. Okay. No. It was, we got it a year and a half in advance. Right. Um, I didn't like what I heard tonight. If the railroad comes, we probably won't need as many parking spaces, but they're always trying to steal our money, so it doesn't matter one way or the other. Right. But I don't think what they're talking about is going to happen. I, a friend of mine, I've been telling him for two years, it's, it's not happening yet. And I said, you'll be lucky if it starts in five years. But it, it's a good thing. We have uh, a five-year renewal. The first year was a 30 years. As a matter of fact, Rick O'Rourke was the town attorney at the time when they worked out the original. Right. It was 30 years. It was a, he said, it wasn't a great job. Yes, it was, but only for the first 10. Because right. after 10 years, you've got to start replacing the pavement and doing this and doing that. And we're re responsible 100% of the upkeep of the, we share half the revenues and all the expenses. Mm -hmm. Now that's not fair, but I'm happy to keep the revenues about $200,000. And if we were to lose that $200,000, we would have a problem with our budgets. So with the five year thing, we. If any road repairs needed to be done, we, we would we, do a real good job so we don't have future problems. No. No? No. We'll keep going at the way it is. No, it, it's in good shape. You know, they ask us to do things. Whatever they've asked us done, we've done, and that's probably one of the reasons they're extending it from the 30 years for an additional five. And I'm thankful for it because I'm going to be covered because I'm on a post this year, but I'm, it's something that the town will have, so we're guaranteed, as long as I'm here, that $200,000, which we can't afford to lose, because we don't get a lot of income. We have to either charge the taxpayers, there's no share in the sales tax, which is going through the roof, yeah. and they gotta find a way to trickle some of that down to the towns. But that's another story, another time, so don't get me upset. I, I fight <laughs> with them all the time, they're used to it, yeah. so. Eric, are okay. you done? You want another question? Um, you yeah, have one more, as long as I'm not involved. What else? No, you don't have any comment. No, I don't have any comment. Happy birthday next month. Oh, thank you. Hey, next month. This next meeting. I know. Okay. And I don't want nothing either. Okay. Dig into his wallet. Okay. Um, you know, we're out walking the streets, quite a few of us. Uh, I'm telling you right now, 911 numbering, it's bad. I mean, you've got to understand. Someday you're going to want these... Fire departments, the ambulances to come, I am telling you now, you have to go back and forth to see what the mailbox before, some mailboxes are on the same side of the road. You're not gonna need it until you need it, and then it may be too late, so please, go out to your mailboxes, go out to your homes, look from the road, and if you sit back way off the road, put a little two by two beam out there, put your number on it, it'd really be helpful. You don't have to put your name, but at least put your number. It's really, really important. I'll entertain a 
Motion. Look that way. <laughs> Do I go home? I'll make a motion to close tonight's meeting. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all for coming.